All right. Welcome, everyone, to the Flux meeting. Today is July the 2nd. And for us, this is an opportunity to um, give a quick recap of our exper experimentation around the, the GitOps toolkit. I think in the beginning, um, Stefan and Hide can maybe, or Michael too can maybe say a few words about um, the toolkit and where things currently stand. Um, in the chat, I gave the link to the agenda doc. If you don't have access to it, um, just request access and I'll, I'll add you to it. Um, I think it would be nice if people could um, add themselves to the doc and then maybe just say a couple of sentences like um, what your interest is and, um, and we can take things from there. Um, who of the Flux folks wants to start off? Or maybe um, did everyone have a quick look at the, at the GitOps toolkit, the link, or maybe um, the video, the, the slides even? Just to set the scene a little bit. Do, how much background do people need? Is basically the question. Um, so, hi, this is uh, Jeremy from uh, Google, and I work on Kubeflow. Um, I've taken a look, a little bit, bit at, look at the um, the website and sort of looked through the functionality um, and, and just briefly, maybe 15, 20 minutes. Um, and uh, just so you know, I tried to edit the doc to introduce myself, but um, I don't seem to have edit permission. I don't know if it's, um, but. It should be like yeah. a request access button at the top somewhere. If you click that, I'll, I'll be happy okay. to. Edit. Great, thank you. Sweet. Um, ah. Yeah, this is Sean again. I work for uh, AT and T, um, and we use the the Helm operator. Uh, we don't use Flux at this point, but um, we we previously used a different uh, Helm deployment tool, uh, declarative Helm deployment tool. We recently switched to the Helm operator, so we're interested in the future of of that. So, all right. Um, Either Michael, Stefan, does one of you want to take the floor and? Stefan, do you feel up to it? Yeah, I can do a, an overview. Going cool, cool. To share my screen. <sighs> my CPU is on fire for some reason, so. I okay, so um, we've started working on on uh, on the GitOps toolkit around two months or almost three months ago, and we've set up some goals uh, for it. Um, first of all, we wanted to have um, common service, something that could serve uh, both um, Flux and uh, Helm operator in terms of uh, operations with git um, so if you if you are a if you are a, a helm operator user for example you know that you can define um, charts coming from a git repository also in flux you can set up the same thing i want my yamls to to come from from a repo and what that means is that both uh, these reconcilers are doing their own uh, Git cloning and they are maintaining uh, maintaining the clone. With with Helm operator is even more complicated because if Flux a, a Flux instance runs for a single repository, but Helm operator can connect to multiple repositories, so it has to maintain all these uh, all these clones inside its, its container. And we started by factoring out a thing called source controller, which is its own uh, deployment inside Kubernetes. It's a Kubernetes operator. 
and that could serve both uh, both demons uh, in terms of um, dealing with uh, Git authentication, uh, PGP verification, and all, all the things that we want. And um, from there, we we started to decouple uh, and pull apart other other things from Flux. For example, we have a customized controller, which is a, a specialized tool for applying plain YAMLs or, or uh, customized overlays. And Hide is working on Helm controller right now, which uh, it's a slimmer version of the Helm operator. Even if the API is the same, it does uh, less things. And doing less means that it can uh, work with uh, um, a variety of, of releases, it will be faster, uh, it will use less resources and so on. Um, and we we got to a, say a, a draft of our roadmap. Um, we, we've said here two things. We want to do a feature parity with Flux read only. And after we we manage to to get there, we'll try to um, create this image update component um, and to offer users a way to migrate from the from the current flux annotations to a custom resource where you can define how how image updates should work. And um, this will also uh, add a lot of improve improvements in terms of observability. You have, a, you have a custom resource where we can attach events and um, emit notifications and so on. Um, also around Flux, we have this uh, external component called Flux Cloud. Um, so made by Justin. What this does is um, forwarding uh, Flux events to Slack and other, I think Slack and some generic webhook. And we've noticed that let's say one in three users um, asked us, are asking us after, after they try out Flux, hey, how do I enable notifications and so on? So um, to have a more, um, more uh, a, a better approach to observability, we we develop a new component into the um, GitOps toolkit called um, the notification controller. And how this works is you can uh, define, um, there's a guide here. So you can define um, external uh, notification systems. Like for example, now it works with uh, Slack, Microsoft Teams, Discord, and Rocket. So for a particular provider, you can create this alert object that um, um, specifies, uh, can specify sources, customizations, and in the future, any other object that we are, um, will be adding to the API. So you can uh, funnel all these events to your um, notification providers. This is where we got today. Our our main interest is to see how uh, how the Flux users are um, are looking at this uh, at the GitOps toolkit and what features um, they think it's important for us to port or introduce in, in the in in the future Flux V2. I'm going to stop sharing because my computer is dead. Stefan, can you comment very quickly about the relation? You just mentioned Flux V2. Can you comment on the relation between that and GitOps Toolkit, since those terms are both being used now? Yes, so the GitOps Toolkit offers a CLI. And with that CLI, you can uh, install on your cluster um, one or um, multiple components that we have today. And, in the future, we think that Flux V2 could be assembled from, from these components. That will uh, match uh, the current Flux uh, features and um, will probably offer uh, a command that 
you could upgrade from Flux V1 to the Flux V2, which is an assemble, which is assembled through, I don't know, source control, customized control, notification control. That could be a way to have Flux V2 in read-only mode um, right now, if you, if you want to try it out. Cool, thanks. And um, one thing when we talk about the roadmap that I think will be important is stuff we want to deprecate, um, especially um, important to talk about with with people who use it, um, because obviously you need to know about that well ahead of time and you know have a recourse to trying to persuade us not to deprecate things if you really need them. So that, that will come up when we talk about the roadmap a bit later, I think. Yeah, um, I can. you want me to go into those details or? No, let's cover it. I think there's a line item in a bit. Okay. Yeah. Um, hi, this is this is Jeremy again. Um, I just have a, a one question. So, um, an alternative pattern that I've seen is you know sort of um, following sort of a left shift philosophy is that you only sort of deal with um, hydrated YAMLs. So you would have sort of a two-step process. Like if you're using Customize or, or Helm, you would sort of hydrate the manifests, you know, run Customize, build, et cetera, and you know, check those manifests um, into to, um, your Git. And then so your, Git, Git, your uh, GitOps tooling only has to deal with like hydrated manifests. So it seems like you're, making, you're adding sort of first-class support for you know, at least Customize and Helm. Um, I'm kind of curious why you've chosen to go down that path. So we are we are trying to move away from um, running all sorts of generators inside the cluster. Uh, right now in Flux, we have this flux.yaml that you could call out to, I don't know, a bash script or a make file inside your repo that will um, generate the yamls on the fly, the, the final bits. Um, with the with the toolkit, we'll we'll want to have a, let's say a, a final version of the, of the YAMLs in your in your repository and apply those. Um, now, for for the customized control, it will run a customized build for an overlay, but it can uh, uh, also uh, apply a plain YAML if you if you do a customized build, let's say in your CI, and you write that output to a dedicated branch or a directory or something. Um, okay. Thank you. And with with Helm, um, yeah, if we if we use Helm as a templating engine, let's say in CI, and you do a Helm uh, template and you write all those YAMLs somewhere, then you'll not need um, a Helm controller anymore, right? They are just plain YAMLs that you can apply with, let's say, customized controller. But then you'll you'll lose all the all the Helm features, like you'll not be able to list releases, you'll not be able to run Helm tests or do automatic rollback and so on. Yeah, so from a slightly different direction, um, to paraphrase that, um, that lots of people have success with Helm and want to stay in that land, just want it to be a bit more um, declarative. And I think that perhaps is um, where Sean, um, I think you said you use Helm operator, but you don't, you don't use Flux. Um, and we find that lots of people are in that position, actually. They they don't need Flux, although they might use it um, for other reasons. But, but the main thing they care about is actually having a better automation for, for Helm. So the reason for the Helm operator um, in the GitOps toolkit is to support those people. But the, there is not a general pattern of if there is another kind of way of generating YAMLs, then there will also be a controller for that. The The plan is um, Helm has a kind of special, is a special case for people that like, that, and there are lots of them that want to live in Helmland. And then, you know, to cover the other bases, that's plain YAMLs and customized because it's built into Kubernetes more or less. Um, thanks. That that makes a lot of sense. I guess so. Um, I guess a follow-on question would be, for for people that are just starting out with with Git or with Kubernetes and they don't have an investment yet in Helm, 
Um, is there what, what's kind of the recommendation, or is there like an emerging consensus, you know, or does Weave have a position or whoever, like whether dealing with hydrated YAMLs and is the better approach, or you know, do we see sort of a consensus emerging? Uh, there is not a consensus in WeaveWorks, okay. <laughs> um, but I can tell you my opinion, which is that I think for most purposes, it is better to have YAMLs as soon as you can. Okay. Before you make a pull request, um, the reason being that most of the tooling uh, operates like if you have something that analyzes your configuration, then it's going to operate on the YAMLs, and it's not going to operate on, you know, your arbitrary program that generates YAMLs. So any kind of CI or linting or anything like that, if you want to be able to run that, then you need the YAML. Um. Yeah, but Helm ecosystem is quite large. There is a Helm Lint, there is an OPA plugin for Helm charts. For oh, sure, uh, that's where Helm gets a pass. Yeah. So there is a project in OPA, uh, in the OPA uh, uh, organization uh, that it's a Helm plugin for, for you to apply uh, policies on, uh, on Helm in CI. So, we also have uh, something like that for GitHub Actions, uh, a Helm release uh, uh, action that I made for um, yeah running uh, things like Kubeval and other other things on on a Helm release itself. So it, it pulls the the Helm chart, it applies the values in the Helm release in CI, and then it validates uh, the static files uh, as they can come out. So. Um, I've seen a lot of people having that approach. Thank you. Jeremy, did you say you work with Kubeflow? I yeah, I work with with Kubeflow. I'm also at Google. Yes. And is that JSON it still? Have I got that right? Oh no, <laughs> we moved off that. We, we, moved, we moved off that when. Uh, um, uh, uh, Casenet got uh, deprecated or, or got. So um, we use uh, Customize, um, and um, I really, I really like it. It works well for us. And then we're starting to use um, kept functions to do more complicated um, transformations. I really like that philosophy. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, just as a as a data point, at least for for Google, and then for some of our. C, C, uh, CD CI infrastructure that we're running for for Kubeflow since that runs um, on GCP. We're using ACM, which is um, Google's GitOps tooling, and um, that just that that's made the decision, at least for now, to only deal with hydrated manifests as one sort of data point to our conversation. Yep, yep. I thought that JSON it might be the motivation for your question, but I was wrong. That's fine. Yeah. But yeah, the the fact you're using kept means that you're already quite heavily tilted towards having um, hydrated YAMLs early on. Yeah, I also talk to Brian Graham a lot, so <laughs> if you and that, yeah. <laughs> Are there any more questions before we move to looking at the the roadmap doc? We did the general overview that Stefan gave. Did that make sense to everyone? Arthur, did you want to say anything? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I just, I don't know if that's the right time to ask. Uh, I'd like to start working on some issues, uh, uh, especially on the observability issue. But I don't know if that's uh, the right time for us, how to get started. And maybe somebody can say a couple of things on where we stand there or what needs to be done. the observability uh, end. I think there is this issue 
that I've posted on the chat. But I, I've, I've asked about it on the Slack channel, but I didn't get any answers. So I'm assuming you guys are really uh, busy with the Flux V2, right? Oh, yeah, the logging uh, thing. Okay. Yeah, logging, uh, metrics, anything that could help before Zebra really. Yeah, so we, we had a pull request to change the logging into JSON, and I think that will improve the observability by a ton. <laughs> but yeah, that pull request got stuck because um, the current Flux logging is kind of loose. And if we try to use Zap like everybody else, like the GitOps Soul Kit, for example, all, all the controllers are using Zap and, and JSON structured logging. But if we if we try to get zap into the current flux, then we'll that means a breaking change to, to our current users because we cannot, for example, the date will not be formatted the same way, and and there are many other issues around error uh, detection. Uh, zap has its own uh, console output that's nowhere near what flux does today, so. Um, we could choose to invest a lot of time in building all this Zap, a Zap plugin that mimics what Flux does today. Or, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know where to go from there. It's sort of the case with lots of stuff in Flux is that it Flux predates things like that, and it doesn't predate Prometheus, but it might sort of predate best practice with regard to Prometheus. So. And of course, since, like Stefan mentioned, since it, people will have come to rely on the way it does stuff, there are backwards compatibility problems. And the only way you can really get past a lot of those is to do a, a major version bump and just break compatibility um, for things like logging, um, which is, is sad, but um, it's just sort of the way it is. <laughs> um, so lots of the things like observability is uh, and making the login better is, although we are very busy, is, is sort of less to do with busyness and more to do with breaking stuff or not wanting to break stuff. And therefore, uh, prioritize. Do you guys think that it's worth to work on this uh, before the release of Flux 2, uh, V2? Or should I wait and see how everything's working and then start working on improving login and metrics? Well, so, uh, hang on, I'm not being muted, no. Um, whatever we do with Flux V2, Flux V1 will be around for a while. Um, and at some point we will be able to pay more attention to it again. Um, obviously, eventually, you know, the ideal is that people move on to Flux V2 because it's you know, more modern and it's, um, better factoring and the more ability to sort of pick and choose which bits you need. But in the meantime, um, there's lots of people that would appreciate work on, on Flux. The difficulty right now is that, yeah, our attention is kind of split between these two things um, and one lasts forever. So that I sort of dodged your question slightly there, Arthur, sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Thanks, it helped uh, a lot already. <laughs> So Arthur, I have a proposition for you. If you are interested in uh, observability future, we futures we haven't got to that part yet. Uh, so we we have the logging sorted out in the GitOps toolkit, but um, and now we we've built notifications into it. And the next step from an observability point of view will will be to have a consistent um, Prometheus metrics across. Um, the specialized reconcilers. So, for example, the, the reconciler that applies YAML and the reconciler that applies Helm chart should have um, should have some metrics in common, so you could easily build a dashboard to observe the whole cluster state. Doesn't matter if it comes something a change comes from a Helm chart or a change comes from from a YAML or whatever. So, if you want to get involved into into building, a, let's say, a draft of what what metrics should we um, 
expose and, uh, and how to do that and create like a common library for all these metrics so we can use them in all the components that would be that would be a great help all right thank you thanks so, so I have a question about scope um, so the, the problem that we're seeing right now in our GitOps journey for, for Kubeflow is actually sort of upstream of um, rolling out our manifests and it's actually in sort of the automation of, of pull requests, right? So we're, we're a multi, you know, repo project. So typically a problem that we would have is, you know, you have one repo where we have the source for our application and then we have another repository where we actually store the customized manifests <clears throat> that we want to, you know, for, for our applications. And so this, the kind of automations that we want to do is we want to, um, after somebody submits a commit to like a, a or pushes a new Docker image, we want to automate, you know, creating a pull request that would update the YAML file that would then reference that, um, uh, that new Docker image, right? And so, you know, the, the, the tools, tooling and library functions that we're sort of looking for are things like, you know, creating, um, uh, uh, a pull request, right? Um, and also, uh, and and so I was kind of wondering if that was in, in, in scope for um, uh, the, the toolkit. Like right now, we, we just kind of like shell out to um, the appropriate CLIs, Git and Hub and whatnot, um, which works. Um, but it seems like this is a common problem. Um, and it seems like there's opportunities for improvement. So I'm just wondering if that's in scope or not. So we, we've decided to, uh, for, for the toolkit to have a better integration with, with the Git providers, um, more than just, you know, have a NS, generate an SSH key pair. Um, for example, if, if you see in the toolkit bootstrap, it can talk directly to the GitHub API or the GitLab API, it creates a repository for you, it sets up deploy keys automatically, teams, um, if the repo is public or private and so on. Um, and we will be working on, um, on a web receiver for all these providers. For example, when you, let's say, open up a request, um, maybe you want to react to, to that uh, action. So that's from, from Git to the cluster. You are asking the other way around, what about the cluster detects some ch changes, right? And talks back to the to the git provider let's say opening up a request for an image update um, yeah i think that that could be could be a nice feature for the write back uh, component instead of writing uh, directly to a um, branch like we are doing with flux today it could could open up a request i had i mean we had this request so many times uh, in flux like i don't want flux to write directly to my master branch i want I want a pull request for it, so. Mm, okay. Okay, uh, sounds great. Um, okay, thank you. I, I would love to uh, collaborate on that. So, you know, let me know um, and maybe we can discuss. I'm not sure where, but um, let's, yeah. Maybe following up on that, I've, the, the biggest issue I've seen with Flux uh, or the last maybe two years has, has been feedback or of like, is something actually deploying properly or are there any issues? And I think maybe six months ago, I created an issue and in flux regarding uh, using the GitHub API to send back statuses on, on Git commits. Is that something, because now when there is actually a, a some sort of notification provider, is that something we could actually do? So, uh, yeah, yeah, would, go, Michael. For this in the last question, the, the um, which are about scope, I think, Answer, uh, and Stefan will give more detail, uh, I think, in a second, but is aspirationally, yes, those sorts of things are in scope. The idea is with the GitOps toolkit specifically is to have stuff that you can mix, mix and match to, um, to put together your own workflows. So um, as Stefan mentioned, if you don't like Flux V1 does its image update automation, and hopefully we can either provide a, a, um, a controller which does a better job and has a bit more kind of flexibility to make PRs or whatever, um, or we can at least work in sympathy with, um, you know, 
how your pipeline driver things like tacked on uh, in order to get your workflows done. And now I'll step out of the way for uh, Stefan to give you some details. Yeah, so so how I, I imagine the, the right back um, will be first with, uh, let's say, if we address uh, GitHub only. We In GitHub, we have a workflow engine called GitHub Actions. And for example, there is an action that can open a pull request for you when uh, a particular user does a commit to a particular branch. So let's say our image update component doesn't do what Flux does today, doesn't push to the, to the same uh, branch that it reconciles with. And you could tell the image updater when you, uh, when you have a patch, when you have a change, don't push to a specific branch. Right? And then you can hook up a GitHub action that reacts to a commit to that particular branch and opens a pull request for your master branch. Right? So even if, let's say, in the, in the, in the first iteration, uh, the GitOps toolkit will not talk to GitHub directly and open a pull request, you can still build an automation through, through GitHub. What we need to, to do is make our component flexible enough so you can specify which branch is, is the destination for that patch, right? Of course, we, can, we, we could go deeper and talk to the GitHub API, to the GitLab API, and open a pull request uh, directly from, from, the, from the daemon. But I think a first, a first step towards that goal will be to you know, um, have a solution for, uh, for working with other workflow uh, solutions that are out there, like, like GitHub Action, which is works really great for, for thing, all things GitHub. Right. Yeah, and to um, address what Philip was asking, I think you can sort of transpose it and make a similar answer, which is um, instead of having, instead of thinking about, you know, something that's making an update and pushing that into a PR, you were some, thinking about something that's observing what happens and then, you know, posting to a webhook where it gets picked up by something that then writes the status into the, um, the GitHub PR. Yeah, exactly. Because I'm mostly just concerned of as, as long as there is some reasonable API that's exposed, that's giving some other controller that can consume events, I think that's fine. The biggest issue I have right now is I have a lot of customers who are, who are uh, a bit, they're, they complain a bit because it's, it's kind of difficult to see, for example, when they commit something to a dev branch, for example, uh, if it actually is pulled into the cluster or not, if there's some issue in the manifest generation or whatever. And the same thing goes for when we're using Helm operator to you know, is the Helm operator actually successful when it's supplying the Helm chart? Uh, so as long as we can get like some sort of event out, building the controller is kind of the easy part. Because right now I'm, I've, I've built something that, that consumes uh, in the same way that Fluxcloud does, consumes the, the WebSocket uh solution that's in flux and some other stuff with the helm operator to actually figure out the the, the status and, and send it back in this case to azure devops yeah the so flux v1 is pretty patchwork with regard to what it tells you about um one reason is um it's very difficult in kubernetes to say anything is ready <laughs> um but that situation has actually moved on um, a bit. There is like case status, for instance, where you can at least ask and get a sort of standardized answer about the set of resources that you care about. Um, so it is possible to say, for instance, you know, the sequence of um, I synced this commit, all the things that I synced in that commit are now reporting ready and have those being sort of halfway reliable, which, which didn't used to be the case. Um, so yeah, I think that's much more possible than it than it used to be, and uh, we could do a less patchwork job at it. So what we what we have today in terms of events and notifications, um, we have an event API. All our controllers will be uh, issuing events, and there are uh, two destinations for these events. One is um, Kubernetes events attached to the custom resource. So for uh, the future Helm controller, everything that happens with the Helm status, you can do uh, get events for that Helm release, and you'll see all, all the things that are happening. 
but there is still an issue with Kubernetes events, and I've learned that the hard way in Flagger. Um, so Flagger at the beginning only did Kubernetes events and nothing else. And because ETCD is not a, a log storage, a logging storage, uh, these events are uh, treated as ephemeral. They get dropped, they get compacted, and so on. And by looking at Flagger users, most of them told me, this thing is not reliable. I cannot reliably uh, subscribe to these events because on GKE, they get dropped after a couple of minutes if you issue too many events, for example. Right. So taking that into consideration, we've also created this notification um, um, controller that receives the event. And from there, with a custom resource, uh, there are, in fact, two custom resources. One is a provider and one is an alert definition. You can say, when I receive an event from a particular, let's say, Helm release, please forward that event to this Slack channel using this webhook. So let's say you could, for example, get in a, in a Slack channel or Microsoft Teams or Discord or, or Rocket all the events that are happening with, uh, with a Helm release uh, cycle. If the test fails, if the install fails, if it rolls back, everything that the Helm operator does in terms of actions will be um, streamed through these events. And um, one, one thing that we, we don't want to get into is uh, events uh, persistence. So for that, we, we can forward all these events to your custom uh, web, um, webhook. And from there, let's say you can create a Lambda function that has an HTTP post, we send that event to you, and from there you can do, I don't know, send it to PagerDuty or save it to Elasticsearch or build your own things after that. Um, there are so many ways you can uh, deal with events, right? Everybody does its own thing. Some people run Elasticsearch, some people use Stackdriver, CloudWatch, you name it. We cannot just integrate with everything out there. So, um, the toolkit offers you this possibility to say, hey, um, forward all these events to my custom endpoint, and from there you can build your own thing around it. But observability in terms of Helm releases and what you apply and the health checks of deployments, uh, stateful sets and daemon sets will, will be um, bubbled out from the cluster in a way or another. That's that's on the roadmap and half half implemented. Uh, he then needs to build it into the Helm controller, but um, it will be there for sure. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. Uh, should we go into reviewing the roadmap? I think Stefan stepped through it a bit already. Um, Super. Yeah, we could review what's what we are not going to keep in Flags V2. I think that's, that's it's very important. <laughs> Yeah, um, maybe you could, Stefan, do you reckon you can do a um, phase by phase, you know, very, very superficial summary of these features, not these features? Yeah. Even if you read it from the, the page. Um, yeah, I'll try to share my screen again. Yeah, maybe just briefly, we should say that this is a uh, roadmap draft, and we're mostly here to to get your feedback and to see if it makes sense. Like none of this is set in stone or announced or anything. Um, it's quite important that we build this together and see what's important to everyone. So for for each milestone in the roadmap, we've set some non goals. And um, for example, to get a future parity with uh, Flux in read only mode, um, that doesn't mean we'll, uh, we'll keep supporting uh, Flux YAML format. 
what what happens today we, today with Flux YAML, you can tell Flux to run uh, arbitrary commands um, using um, I don't know a binary that's in the container that's in comes with with the Flux container like customized binary or um, kubectl binary, um, and you can also call out to a bash script or a make file because make is installed, bash is installed, and so on. And what what we've seen after we we launched this feature is the fact that it's very very hard to debug what's going on because a lot of things are all conflated in a inside your cluster in a container and Flux executes it and um, we Stefan, one second. can you yeah. um, use the font size a little? What's the word? Bigger? Yes. Uh, yeah, I think we're good. So for for our current Flux YAML users, um, those that are uh, using Flux YAML to do customized build will uh, will have a, a migration guide how you can uh, run the same customized commands, but in a safe way without uh, executing to the, to the customized uh, CLI directly and you not be able to pipe several things. But I'm seeing that people are iterating through directories. They do customized build on each directory. And at the end, they apply everything. That will not be supported. You have to create a customized YAML uh, that includes all the other customizations uh, and run that, only that one. Or uh, there, are, there are several ways with, uh, with the customized controller to be able to do the same thing. Uh, but for those that are, you know, just um, running random scripts in in, uh, in the container, that will not be supported. And we advise our users try to um, think of ways to migrate away from that and and do the uh, YAML um, compilation generation in in CI or somewhere before it, uh, it reaches the, um, the Git repository or a particular branch or a tag or whatever. Um, so that's one, one aspect, Flux YAML. And another aspect is the, um, um, is the image update feature where we are not planning to support, uh, um, we are not planning to have backwards compatibility with Flux V1 annotations. Um, right now there are, I think, three ways of defining the same thing because we have the old Flux notations where it was under the WeWorks organization, then we moved to CNCF, so we had uh, different types of annotations, but those were kind of confusing, so we came up with yet another uh, kind of annotations uh, where you can pinpoint exactly where uh, the image is, the registry and the uh, uh, image tag. Um, works kind of like selectors inside inside the YAML, and we've seen like a lot of people have. Um, if if you mistype something, but you have enabled uh, Flux automation, then Flux will just ignore all those uh, paths and will automatically update to the latest uh, image that was pushed on the cluster. And this is. Um, this is kind of dangerous because maybe in production you want to do only same words, you mistype something in the annotation and instead of a new same release, you'll end up with, I don't know, uh, something deployed from dev if, uh, if um, you use the same registry for all your uh, environments. So in order to, to improve this, uh, this thing, we're going to create a custom resource that has validation that you can... Um, somehow test before you you actually apply it and um, that's that's uh, another thing for helm operator um, for the first iteration we decided to drop support for helm v2 and the the toolkit components uh, the helm controller in the uh, in the toolkit will only support uh, helm v3 and um, I think that's that's one of the 
major breaking changes. Uh, another one at the moment, um, we we are going to release a Helm controller that works only with Helm repositories, not with Git repositories. And we could reconsider that later on if um, there is an interest for it. I think that sums up the non-goals for the GitOps Toolkit Flux V2, Helm Operator V2. Thanks, Stefan. Did anyone have so, a reaction? Tara. Yeah, one one quick question here. Um, so you're removing the support for Helm charts from Git. Um, there's one specific feature that is only supported uh, for values files within the chart if it is it only works if it's in Git. You cannot use it when it's in a chart repository. Um, this is something that we had a lot of trouble with uh, implementing in our first phase because we wanted to pin the chart version and the image version together. Um, so that way, when someone builds their code, the version of the chart, you're always going to have the lock commit to the same commit that was the um, the build artifact came out as. Um, how would you handle that scenario where those need to go step together in this instance? Because the, the image update flow, you've also said you're removing a lot of the custom ability um, in order to lock those two commits together. So like, if you can't have customized, then inject um, inject both, and you're removing the ability to supply the supplemental values file from within the chart. Um, how would you do those? Just a note on the annotations. Um, the thing that's being, it, so we're breaking backward compatibility, but we're not removing them entirely, just removing okay. the order options and maybe chopping and changing it a bit. But the the feature, I think, um, may still survive. So in, in terms of, of Helm releases, what, what we have today in source controller is the ability for you to say, get me the latest release of a, of a Helm chart that matches um, Samver um, expression, a Samver range. That was not supported in Helm operator. Uh, at the moment. So you are forced into matching uh, image, uh, container images with configuration. How we are solving this issue is by allowing you to say, hey, I'm every time I'm changing configuration and containers, I'm going to create a new version of the chart. I'm going to push that chart to my Helm repository. Then source controller will detect, hey, there is a new chart version. It will pull that chart into the cluster and Helm controller will apply. And what you will apply is both new images coupled with the right configuration. Does it make sense? I guess so. Um, it still wouldn't be able to selectively apply. So our scenario is that we're choosing a values file from within the chart and that only works from the Git um, it does not work at, with a chart source being as a chart repository. So that's one feature that would be lost. And so in order to be able to march those together, that's kind of how we solved that problem. And we did not use semvers in order to do this. We had to use the git tag or git sha as our reference. So yeah. um, if, if you're suggesting that we would be able to and a fully semvered, I guess, a way of thinking about our build artifacts accomplish the same. Um, is that what you're saying? Because yeah. you could, in theory, before you apply the chart, unpack it, look inside it, and in a non-get scenario, apply a values file from within the chart. But that would be a much more complicated task to do in the Helm operator, for sure. So I, I think we could support um, paths to, to value files inside the chart with, with the new controller. Hide, is that right?
Yes. Uh, because we don't enter the the chart, but we but the, what the new or at least the proof of concept thing I'm working on does at the moment is it simply fetches the turbo and then gives it to Helm and then it works just like feeding your Helm CLI uh, some artifact, but it doesn't enter. But I think it would be possible. But the same is like Git isn't included at the moment because we. A non go is it's a non go for now. I can imagine that we will add it at a later moment to the source controller and things will, or at least it will be able to build Helm charts for coming from some Git repository. I think the, um, the reason it's not uh, a goal for now is not to do with. It's not a principal decision so much as a priority. Is that not if that's a fair statement? Yeah, he's he does nodding. Um, so it's not something that's ruled out. It's just something that it was like the first iteration of the Helm operator used Git exclusively, and that turned out to be what ninety percent of people didn't want. So then we did the other thing. <laughs> so we're just respecting that kind of priority this time around. The Helm operator is <laughs> a complicated piece of code is due to the fact that it started with Git. So by taking the Helm first approach, I'm hoping to, for example, prevent uh, that we rely on dry runs to be able to detect when we need to perform an upgrade. We basically do Right now is the state machine around Helm state machine. And the Helm controller will simply keep track of what it's. If on the next run it no longer matches the, the recorded or the, the Helm state no longer matches the recorded state from the custom resource, it will simply perform an upgrade instead of doing a dry run and then trying to figure out if. Uh, because the problem with Helm dry runs is that a dry run object is much more, much richer than something you retrieve from the Helm storage. For example, dependencies, uh, metadata gets lost as soon as you put it into the Helm storage, um, which makes it very unreliable uh, in some scenarios. And um, I've been fighting edge case scenarios for, for months now. On Helm, the Helm route first without involving Git, it will be a much better or much easier to build a better solution. But that doesn't mean we are not going to ever and to create Helm charts from Git without using the Helm controller. So Tai, if you could reference uh, a value file that sits in the chart itself, will that solve your problem? Let's say, so you, you create a new chart release. Uh, by default, if you push it to a Helm repository, then you have to use Semver because Helm repositories only support Semver, which from our perspective is the best way to, to deal with, uh, um, you know, production systems. Like you don't have to look at timestamps or anything like that, you just, uh, just give a, Assemble range. If you if we can if you can reference uh, a different values than the values the default values YAML from from the chart itself, would that solve your issue? Yeah, I think so. I my first pass when implementing Flux did exactly that. It, the tag was different than the semver the, for the chart, obviously uh, the image tag. So like we ended up having to not use Flux's auto release feature and make the commits from the CI to do that. But if you could then reference via a chart repository chart one of the sub a file within it as a as an additional like dash f flag for home, then yes, that would that would work. 
Great, we should note this down. <laughs> yeah, I think it's uh, to be like to, to be on the Helm release or on the Helm chart object. On the Helm release object, right? Right. Right now, it is specified in the Helm release object, and if it's a Git source, you just specify the the additional values file, and it's like. For us, it would be environments developed at YAML. Um, but then that would be how we, that's how we have all our charts versioned with between different environments. So inside the, the chart itself, you'll bundle values minus dev, values minus staging, values minus production. Then in a Helm release, you'll say, okay, I want to install this chart, but I want mm -hmm. to use values minus dev because, well, that that particular cluster is a dev cluster. So you can set it up like that in Git. Exactly, yeah. I, I think this was, and this is something that's kind of been historical, like it, that's how they were doing Helm charts five years ago here. And so that's kind of something that's lived on for a long time. Probably not the best practice for handling values, but Helm is also a little awkward. Um, for handling multiple environments as you can't like do variable interpolation inside your values files. Yeah. Yeah, we've seen we've seen users doing so they have a helm release in a base directory. Then they use customize to patch the helm release value the so the values field inside the helm release they patch it with customize uh, based on on environments then they tell flux okay the flux running on the dev cluster should sync with the dev overlay and when you run customize when flux runs customize build it patches the the helm release from base with the values that you need on them right and that, that will, makes sense that will I, I... be supported, uh, of course, uh, in the GitOps toolkit because it already does customize, so it's fairly easy to, doesn't need any kind of modifications, but your use case is also valid where, where you have all these uh, overlays inside the, the chat itself. For example, the stable charts like uh, Redis or Elasticsearch, or if you look at those, they have values and values production, <laughs> most of them. So uh, it's not only you who is doing that. A lot of people are doing are doing the same. I noticed we're at the top of the hour. I don't know if people have to run to other meetings now or if you can go a bit longer. Um, definitely, the Michael, how about you? I have to run and make a cup of tea before my next meeting. Right, OK, OK. Um, yeah, I don't know about Stefan Hider. Michael, please interrupt me if I'm saying anything stupid. But I feel like this was like great feedback already. Um, I think it would be good if everyone could take the time to subscribe to the Flux Dev mailing list, because um, I mean, it's, it's, it's low traffic. And uh, we'll continue the conversation there and the uh, Flux Dev Slack on CNCF. What I'm going to do is, um, I think for the next time, it would be good if we did weekly meetings, would be my suggestion just to, uh, you know, refine the roadmap. And um, so I think I'll start a conversation, like finding a good time that works maybe a bit better for the Americas. Um, but I'll, I'll inform you through that, through that mailing list as well. Any last things or any things where you need particular help or input right now? Yeah, I, I would like to ask Tai if, uh, if he can open a, an issue on the Helm minus controller repository in Flux in the organization uh, around the use case we, we've discussed. And I'll take that yeah. into consideration. Thank you. Yeah, so specifically, the there's two, there's Helm operator and Helm controller. Controller is the new one, so that's the one you want. Yeah, at some point, uh, we will merge the two. <laughs> so
So yeah, but it's it's far away. But we in the future there will be no helm controller and helm operator to just be one of those two. Uh, but for now, we we want to keep them separate so we don't mix um, all the dependencies and so on. Super. Are we done? Yep. Excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. Coming along and yes, great question. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.